Thank you. You may be seated. Grace that is greater than all our sin. That's a magnificent thought and true to the Word of God. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus, that passage that I just read a few moments ago. Exodus chapter 14, we're looking at verses 15 through 20, and in particular, the last two verses, where we find the Shekinah glory of God moving, separating, and giving both light and darkness. Fascinating. In our recent studies, of course, last week was our Mission Sunday, so we're doing a quick review here. But most recently, we've been discussing the reason for the 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years is a long time, folks. Some of you were married more than 40 years. Many of you are more than 40 years old. Some of you are twice that age. But you know that 40 years is a very long time. We looked at the reasons that God told Moses that he would see the promised land, but that he would not go in. God also said that the children of Israel would stay at Kadesh Barnea for a very long time because of their rebellion. Yeah, 40 years is a long time. You know, 1,400 years was a long time from the time of the Exodus to the time of Jesus. 2,000 years was a very long time from the time of Abraham and the great promises till the time of the Messiah. 2,000 years is a long time from the time of our Lord Jesus Christ until today, and we still await his return. But in the eyes of God, it's because he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but he's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. There are still those of his elect who have not yet heard, and perhaps you and I are the means that he has chosen for them to hear, and yet, like Israel in the wilderness, we have stubbornly dragged our feet. We have failed to witness to that friend or that neighbor or that casual acquaintance or even the individual on the street whom we were prompted to give a tract to and we did not. And so we still wander in the wilderness. Long periods of time seeing promises of God, but not yet inheriting them. We saw why Moses was kept out of the land. He sinned by striking the rock twice, that is, on a second occasion. And God said, I'm going to keep you from going into the land because you've not sanctified me in the eyes of the people. What I told you to do is speak to the rock. I didn't tell you to strike it a second time. I said, speak to it. God is a God of precision. God expects exact obedience, not partial or almost obedience, or obedience that's, quote, good enough for government work. God expects obedience. I hope we're learning some of the lessons that we are seeing here because this affects individuals and churches. These things were written for our exhortation upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are moving toward the ends of the world. You see the darkness deepening around you today. But as we saw, their rebellion proved at least five things. It proved at least five things in relation to Israel and gives us principles which apply to the church. The first thing where we saw their rebellion affected them, it guaranteed a long and lingering death. Death, not in a comfortable bed, but death in the desert. Everybody age 20 and over, 
died. God said, I'm going to make sure. Imagine that you were 20 years old. You had just passed your 20th birthday. That was the death knell for you. You would never see the land. Suppose you were just one day short of your 20th birthday. You would get to see the land, but you wouldn't get to see it until you were 60 years old. Disobedience never has good results. There are always consequences to our choices even the little choices. These things happen to individuals and churches today for the same reason. Rebellion against the direct commands and prohibitions of the Word of God will have an impact. The second thing that we saw, and this was all new material the last time we were together, the rebellion guaranteed that the stubborn, hard-hearted rebels would not have any forward movement in their spiritual or physical journey. We've studied a lot about that in the past, about the point of no return. That's true for believers today, too. Oh, you're saved eternally. But you can reach a point of no return where, in fact, you will stagnate, where you will atrophy in your spiritual growth, where you will stop in your forward progress and divinely approved success when you step outside of the will of God. That's true for churches. That's true for individuals. Sometimes things occur that guarantee the death of a church, no matter how much it later tries to move forward until all the original rebels, as in Israel, were dead. Third, the rebellion of Israel guaranteed that when they tried to fix things up by deciding to do what God commanded after they had already said no. God guaranteed that the enemy would beat the daylights out of them. In other words, the principle of repentance too late, just like Esau, who found no place for repentance, so he sought it carefully with tears. That ties us together with the principle of the point of no return. Fourth, the rebellion guaranteed that they would not personally inherit the land, even though it had been promised to them. That shows that the promises and blessings of God can be lost for disobedience, even though salvation cannot. But you can lose the promises and blessings of God. That also happens to people and to churches today. At some point, because of our hard hearts, the blessing promised to us is gone. Those blessings will evaporate even as though they had never been there. Fifth, their rebellion guaranteed that the reason they rebelled was both stupid and irrelevant. We talked about that quite a bit, and I'll give you just a few of the illustrations that we used. But their rebellion was stupid and irrelevant. They claimed their kids would become slaves to the pagans. You know that argument was both stupid and irrelevant? Because who was leading them? It was God. Could not God protect their children if they obeyed him? It was an irrelevant reason because they had a direct command from God to go forward. And everything is irrelevant when it conflicts with a direct command from God. It doesn't matter. You merely obey. Christian parents today are amazed when their children turn out bad after the stupid parents send them to public schools, let them watch TV, let them play on the internet and have their own cell phones, let them participate in questionable activities, and as is coming up next week, send them out on Halloween, and generally encourage them to become slaves to the pagan culture around them. Number six. The disobedient, self-serving claims of the Israelites proved at least four things, which also prove things about our disobedience. Their self-serving claims and our self-serving claims prove, number one, they really had not learned to obey God. Number two, they really had not learned to walk by faith. 
Number three, it proved they only had temporal values instead of eternal values. Number four, it proved they didn't understand the sovereign, omnipotent God and his power even after seeing with their own eyes the ten plagues in Egypt. And even after personally crossing the Red Sea on dry ground, they still complained after that. And in general, they manifested for the tenth time that they would not obey and they expected to get away with it. Don't push God too far. We read about how Moses was kept out of the land in Deuteronomy chapter 1. I'll not read that again, but he reminds them of why God said he couldn't go in and then why they abode many days in Kadesh according to the days that he abode there, Deuteronomy 1.46. So that brings us to Light in the Darkest Night, part 4. We want to continue our study of light as one of the grandest themes of the Bible, beginning with the Exodus and its connection to Jesus Christ. The Exodus is directly connected in Scripture to our Lord Jesus Christ. First, Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that led Israel, guarded Israel, gave darkness to the Egyptians, revealed God to Israel, and he is the one who reveals the Father to us. Jesus said so. John chapter 12, verse 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. <clears throat> now, before I go on with this, you know, at the funeral of Marilyn Fawcett yesterday, and, or the memorial yesterday, the funeral on Wednesday, we read passages from two different chapters in Revelation. We read passages from Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation chapter 22 where it tells us that Jesus himself is the very light of heaven. In Revelation chapter 21, there are, at the first part of that chapter, and at the last part of the chapter, verses that tell us that. <clears throat> Verse 9, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Ah, light in the city. Where does it come from? End of the chapter tells you. Verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city, that is that city that he sees descending from heaven, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. That's Jesus who radiates the light. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. The light of Jesus never goes out. Revelation chapter 22, the very next chapter, also speaks of that light and of the Lamb. This is Revelation 22, beginning in verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. In the preceding chapter, it told us that Jesus gives the light. Here it says, the Lord God giveth them light. That means Jesus is God. Who was it that led the children of Israel through the wilderness wanderings? People will generally answer God. But if Jesus is the source of the Shekinah light, and we'll see some passages in just a moment that also say that, who was it that led Israel through the wilderness? Against whom did they rebel when they decided they didn't like what God was doing? Against whom was Moses in rebellion when he struck the rock the second time? It was Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, to be sure, but the second member of the Godhead. 
The Bible begins with light. When God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it ends with light. Light at the very beginning, opening chapter of Genesis, light at the very end, closing chapter of Revelation, a perfect circle of consummation in Christ. You remember, Jesus is the one who created all things, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. The Bible begins with light, it ends with light. John tells us why in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. Here's the message. He's about to give you the message. What is the message John wants to give? He starts his first epistle with it. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, here's the message, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Dear friends, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Do you wonder why they don't love Jesus? It shouldn't be a surprise. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Number two. Jesus himself fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament which say the Messiah will bring light to those who sat in darkness. Isaiah is quoted that way in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts and in 2 Peter. Matthew chapter 4 verse 16, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. To them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Luke says, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. In chapter 2, Luke says, a light, not merely to lighten Israel, but a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Acts 13, 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Chapter 26, 13 chapters later, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Jesus is the light. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.19 We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Two things are mentioned in that verse, light in the dark place and the day star arising in your heart. And here Peter is making a play on some very important messianic principles we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have the written word, which parallels the living word. And it says, until the day spring arise in your heart. The day spring is the word that is used for the coming Messiah in Zacharias' prophecy at the birth of John the Baptist. Arises in your hearts. Third, since Jesus himself is the light, all of the references to the Shekinah glory speak of him. Since Jesus himself is the light, all the references to the Shekinah glory speak of him. I quoted it just a moment ago in John chapter 1, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in the darkness 
the darkness comprehended it not. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him, that is Jesus, might believe. He, that is John the Baptist, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He's talking about Jesus. Because in verse 14 he says, transferring his picture to the Word, he says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word who became flesh is Jesus. And we beheld what? His glory. His doxa. The Greek for the Shekinah of the Old Testament or the Shekinah. We beheld His glory. He is the source of the light because He's the one that said, let there be light in Genesis 1. He's the one who is the light of the city, the new Jerusalem descending from heaven where there is never any light, ever, never any night for the light never goes out. Dear friends, it makes me weep to know this is my Lord and that in my heart there is much darkness. Let the light of Jesus shine in you and let the light of Jesus shine through you. There will come a day when all of us will wish that we had let it shine more brightly. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Number four. Number four. There are two stages to being light in the world. So number four is stage number one. While Jesus was here, he himself was the light of the world. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You can't get any plainer than that. It's not just other people said that about Jesus. Jesus claimed it. He is the glory of God. He is the light of God. He is the light in the beginning. He is the light in the Exodus wanderings. He is the light that appears to Isaiah in chapter 6. For Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And he saw the seraphim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. John chapter 12 tells us that was Jesus. That Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah 6, John 12. Do you know who you worship when you speak of Jesus? He is the dweller of the Shekinah. The majestic, magnificent God of the universe. And what petty little worms we are groveling in the dirt of planet Earth. He loves us. I love these verses. John chapter 9, verse 5. Jesus speaking. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. There is no light without Jesus. Neither initial light or reflected light. So that's number five, brings us to stage two. Number five is stage two. 
after Jesus went back to heaven, he has called us to reflect his light and to be a light to all those around us as we work, walk through the kingdom of darkness and the darkness of the king of darkness. Jesus said so. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. Ye, that's the plural, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. This morning I had the privilege of reading for the first time a missionary letter that came this past week. The Lord motivated me to read it. I thought, i got to prepare a sermon. got to get this thing finished. But I had a compelling feeling I better read that letter. A missionary who is now working among Muslim people and at the point that he was writing his journal which was part of this letter. He was in Istanbul, which used to be Constantinople. He was walking through what used to be Hagia Sophia, the uh, Church of Holy Wisdom, until I believe it was 1143. The most, it was a Christian church, a magnificent, gigantic, largest church in the world. It is now today a Muslim mosque when the Muslims came in and killed all the Christians. And they've defaced all the Christian symbols in there, but he went into a side room that had at one time been a prayer chapel. And even though the Muslims had painted over all of the different Christian symbols that had been painted on the walls, in there, as he looked up, the paint over the centuries had been flaking away and he could see the outline of a golden cross. Very faint, but it was there. And then he met some real believers in the city. A gigantic city. Thirty of them meeting together. The pastor has been arrested many times, spent much time in prison. He spoke with the pastor and with his wife, and the pastor's wife said, you know, when at first we became Christians, I was very much afraid. But she said, we've been arrested many times but not yet killed. Someday we may be killed, but how much better to live and be arrested and be killed than to hide our light so that no one else would ever know. And we're ashamed to pass out a track calendar. Jesus is the light. If we do not reflect him, we're like the candle that's hidden under a bushel. You see, Jesus isn't visible on earth today. You are his reflection. And so am I. How are we reflecting Jesus? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. You've got to have light to see stuff. They will never see your good works unless your light is shining. Your good works, so-called, are irrelevant if they're in the dark. And the light 
is Jesus. It's not the light of good works. It's the light of Jesus so that they can see your good works and how they relate to Christ. And glorify your Father, which is in heaven. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they may, which enter in might see the light. You're pointing them to light. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick that they which come in may see the light. The goal is for them to see the light, not us, to see the light. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. That's a way to get an attention, isn't it? Hey, they'll lock you up in the funny farm for sure. You climb up on your roof and start preaching. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Number six. We are called children of light. I mentioned this in passing a couple of weeks ago. I want to talk about it a little more today. We are called children of light because a child reflects the character of his father. We are called children of light. That is, if you're a true believer, if you're not a true believer, this does not apply to you. We are called children of light because a child reflects the character of his father. But the child is smaller than his father. The child is not as wise as his father. But the child will reflect what his father is like because the child grows up admiring his father. The child grows up in the father's home seeing what the father does. The child follows the father around and admires what he does at work and admires when he goes fishing and admires when he does whatever else he does, auto mechanics and working on the car at home. The little boy wants to be like his daddy. The little girls want to marry somebody like their daddy. are children of light because the child reflects the character of his father. Luke 16, 8. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. In their generation. The book of Psalms tells us that David, after his, after his, I'm not, not quoting it correctly, forgive me. Um, it says, David fell on sleep after he served his generation. You and I are going to die someday. It's been very, very clearly brought home to us this past week. We're going to die. The rapture may occur first, but most of us will probably die first. Things have not gotten as bad as they can get. Will it be said of us, we have served our generation. The children of this world are serving their generation. They are promoting their ideals. They are promoting their standards. They are promoting the one who is their father. And Jesus told us who that is. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, neither uh, because there is no truth in him. He's a liar and speaks of his own. He's the father of lies. His children are going to do that. You look at the candidates and you hear some lies going on. You hear some who are inveterate liars. What does it tell you about their father? They reflect their father. But they're wise in this generation. They're reaching their goals. They're promoting their agendas. And people are believing it. And people are falling for it. Are we as wise 
in our generation. It says the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Why? Why? Because we're not reflecting our Father. John 12, 36, While ye have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed. And here, listen to this phrase, And did hide himself from them. He was giving them a graphic illustration of what happens when the light is not visible. Where do you spend your time? Who are your friends? What delights your heart? What entertainment draws you and pulls you most strongly? Is it darkness or is it light? Paul says something about that. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? How do you spend your free time? What kind of videos do you watch? DVDs. I'm old school videos, you know. What do you watch on TV? What do you watch on the internet? What do you read? Who are the people you really feel comfortable with? Light or darkness? What communion have light with darkness? Paul tells you that if you're a believer, your life should have been transformed. It should have been changed. It should have made a difference when you trusted in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 tells us, For you were sometimes darkness. All of us were at one point. We were lost. We were in utter outer darkness. But now, he's writing to people who have trusted Christ. And he knows they've trusted Christ. And he writes one of the two most in-depth doctrinal epistles in the entire New Testament, Romans and Ephesians. He writes it to the church at Ephesus. You are sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Man, that's our position. Great. All set, ready to go, don't have to do anything else. No, 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 read the last phrase. If you're light in the Lord, what are you supposed to do? Walk as children of light. Folks, that's a command, that's not a suggestion. That means that what we believe in our head must transfer somehow out of our hands and our bodies and our life and our attitudes and our motives and our thought patterns and our speech patterns and our actions. It's a main theme among Paul's epistles, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Paul saw a black line between the two. Clear distinctions, no gray areas, no fuzzy stuff. It's either darkness or light, darkness or light, darkness or light. You can't have one foot in one area and the other foot in the other area. You are either in darkness or you are in light. You're either showing forth darkness or you're showing forth light. Because the moment you stop showing forth light because of a compromise, you are in darkness. You can't straddle the fence. 1 Peter 2.9 But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. But do you think that's rather significant? He says you're a peculiar people. Now we know where all of us are peculiar. That's not what it is meant by the word peculiar here. You're a very special people. Has God given us a position that sounds pretty good? A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. That's even better. A holy nation. A peculiar people. 
Why did God do it for you? He tells you in the last half of the verse. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It must be transformational. If it hasn't transformed you, you may not yet be out of the kingdom of darkness. You may be trying to imitate light. You may be using disposable batteries. But you don't have an internal source of light that never runs dry. Number seven. While Jesus was on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him on the Mount of Transfiguration. I covered that briefly four or five weeks ago. Let me just remind you of it. Matthew 17, 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Moses and Elijah were there with him too. Where are Moses and Elijah? Where was Jesus, the one who was producing the light so that they could be seen? Jesus is always the resident of the Shekinah. The Shekinah that gives light to one and darkness to another. Jesus is in heaven according to John also chapter 12 at the same time that he's on earth number 8 our time is up we'll save number 8 for next week our gracious heavenly father we do thank you once again that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and father he's called us now that he's in heaven He's called us to reflect his light. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and place it under a bushel, upon a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. We are supposed to be the ones giving light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Father, we thank you once again for the power of your word, for its clarity, for its beauty, and for the light that it gives us to walk the path day by day. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. How wonderful to have a light that burns the stench of sin out of our lives. Even like the focused beam of the most powerful laser light can burn up trash. Take your word, Father, let it not return void, but let it accomplish that which you please. And let it prosper in the thing where you have sent it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 63, All Creatures of Our God and King. Let's stand to sing all the verses, number 63.